taste and see that the Lord is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you were paying close attention last week, you might have noticed that today's gospel began where last week's gospel ended, and we get a little bit of a repetition. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Marianne preached a beautiful sermon about the bread of life. The bread of life is being beaten and robbed and still knowing the love of God. The bread of life is being able to share yourself with others in a way that's a blessing to both of you. It's so important that we need to hear it again. We're in the third week of a five-week series from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Each week is about bread. In the Gospel two weeks ago, Jesus fed 5,000 people. In last week's Gospel, people were already asking for more bread. And Jesus explained that that kind of bread isn't really the point. That the bread of God comes down from heaven and gives life for the world. And as we've heard twice now, Jesus is the bread of life. In today's gospel, people start pushing back, and we shouldn't be too hard on them for being confused. When Christianity was a new religion, one of the misconceptions among non-Christians was that Christians practiced cannibalism. And it's easy to see why. Eating the flesh of man sounds a little strange. It's a metaphor that isn't really a metaphor. We use lots of metaphors around eating. To taste is to sample or try something out. We chew on something when we want to give it a good think. To swallow means to accept. And we're familiar with what it means to choke, to not be able to complete or perform some expected task. And if we say a group really ate it up, that means that they enjoyed that activity or speaker or presentation. The people interacting with Jesus were happy to receive the bread while seated on the mountainside. They ate up the bread, but they aren't eating up Jesus' commentary about it. The bread was familiar and welcome, but Jesus himself? They don't understand how to chew on that, and they aren't willing to swallow. Eating is a metaphor for accepting and even enjoying something. When we listen to God's word, when we experience God in our relationships with one another, that is metaphorical eating. But when we take communion, that isn't metaphorical or even symbolic eating. It's real eating. That real chewing and swallowing of the body of Christ is important. I had a conversation with someone who'd been taught as a child not to chew the host, but instead let it dissolve on her tongue. I encourage chewing. I know it doesn't take much chewing, but when we consider the metaphorical meaning of chewing, I think it's an important step. It matters that we are really contemplating the body of Christ before we swallow it. And then we do swallow. It's a physical, biological process, but it has metaphorical meaning too, in the acceptance of what we're doing, intentionally bringing Jesus into our bodies. As a three or four year old child, our daughter offered this comment, unprompted from the back seat of the car on the way home from church one Sunday. I know Jesus is inside me because I eat him every week. If you have questions about the Eucharist, I encourage you to speak to a young person about it. They can be very insightful. I want us to consider this, the the gospel according to Hannah. I know Jesus is inside me because I eat him every week. If Jesus is the bread of life and you consume this bread weekly in a physical way at the altar rail and daily in a spiritual way by interacting with God in scripture and in your prayer life and interacting with each other, then you have the bread of life as well. It's the message that Jesus is trying to convey. The Father abides in the Son and when when we consume the Son, the Son abides in us. Jesus offers himself the bread of life. And when we have Jesus, we can offer the bread of life too. The point of Christian discipleship is to be able to offer the love of God back to God and to others. 
We want to be able to give the bread of life. That means helping others be ready to swallow it. Today's psalm helps us with that by providing us with a starting place. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What might it look like to offer a taste of God to someone else? Imagine working behind the counter at an ice cream shop. You have access to all of the flavors. You have the power of the scoop. And you have also lots of those tiny little spoons to dish out tastes. You offer someone else a taste of God when you invite them to church or share the link to the Sunday service. You offer someone else a taste of God when you tell them about your own prayer practices. You offer a taste of God when you experience God's presence in your own life and you point it out to someone else. What tastes good to some people doesn't taste good to others. Remember that sometimes people experience things that leave a bad taste in their mouth about church or Christians or even God, and it makes them afraid to taste again. Be gentle as you offer samples. The portion of the letter to the Ephesians as we read, that we read today has several examples of way to offer others a taste of living bread. Speak truth. Make your words give grace. Be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Be imitators of God. Live in love. When you do these things, others will be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. And so will you. We taste and see this living bread that Jesus offers is indeed good. Good enough that we want to take great big mouthfuls of spiritual friendships and prayer and grace. And these are things that should be chewed and savored. A spiritual friendship is not something you gulp down like medicine. It's more like a fine meal or rich chocolate cake. Thorough chewing gives you more opportunity to enjoy it and consider all the components. Chewing in the form of questions or differing perspectives can be very faithful. And then it's time to swallow. Swallowing is a choice. Anyone who's ever fed a baby knows this. You might spoon feed that child, but if he or she doesn't like pureed green beans, they're just come, gonna come sliding out the corners of the baby's mouth. Be graceful here. All of us made in the image of God have the freedom to choose God or not. And God loves us no matter what we choose. As disciples of Jesus, we offer people the opportunity to taste and see that God is good. As disciples of Jesus, we give people ideas to chew on, and we allow them time and space to chew for a good long time. As disciples of Jesus, we let people swallow bit by tiny bit, if necessary, when they are ready on their own terms, and we love them the whole time. But here's an interesting thing about swallowing. Only the first part is voluntary, once food hits your esophagus, what happens next is involuntary. Your body takes over. Food moves from your esophagus to your stomach and beyond. Now I'm going to give you a break and spare you the rest of the journey through the digestive system, but I wanted to make a point here first. You choose to swallow, but you don't control anything that happens next. The ultimate result, your entire body receiving nourishment, is not dependent on your understanding or control of digestion. Similarly, once you choose to swallow the bread of life, God is in control. You taste, you chew, you swallow, but God makes the bread of life active and alive within you. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? When you come to the altar rail today, I want you to take just a moment to truly taste the bread and wine on your tongue. Chew it, swallow it, and then give thanks to God for what God will work in you. The bread of life isn't a metaphor at all. Thanks be to God.